Access to Democracy is made possible by donations from the following organizations. Thomson Reuters, a global company with expertise and insight to unravel complex situations in the areas of law, tax, compliance, government, and media. Their worldwide network of journalists and editors keep customers up to speed on relevant global events. Thomson Reuters, The Answer Company. Crutchfield Dermatology, a full-service treatment center and medi-spa in Egan. Their goal is to help you look good and feel great with beautiful skin. The Minnesota Twins are looking forward to another great season in 2023, led by the return of All-Stars Carlos Correa and Brian Buxton. With the return of numerous players who were injured in 2022 and some new acquisitions, another division crown and a return to the World Series are in their sights. Established in 2007, 45th Parallel Spirits was among the first 50 micro distilleries in the United States. Based in New Richmond, Wisconsin, all aspects of production occur at our facility. If you're interested in visiting and learning more about the 45th Parallel Distillery, please check our website and plan a visit to tour our facility and taste our spirits. Truestone Financial, with locations in Minnesota and Wisconsin, has proudly served as members since 1939. Truestone engages, educates, and supports its members to ensure they have the tools to empower their financial well-being. Truestone Financial, your neighborhood credit union. Learn more at truestone.org. Welcome to Access to Democracy. I'm your host, Steve Francisco. Today's show, we have a return visitor who was with us recently, Michael Burnt, who is the president of two colleges at the same time, Inver Hills Community College and the Dakota County Technical College in Rosemount, Minnesota. Welcome back to Access to Democracy, Michael. I'm happy to be here. Look forward to the conversation. Thank you. So we just had you on a few weeks ago. You were interviewed with your friend and colleague, uh, Mark Jacobs, mm -hmm. and you were discussing your work with the Dakota Dakota Workforce Development Board right. where the college is working to try to coordinate with employers to match students to job opportunities. It was such a good discussion that we thought we needed to get you back to flesh that out <laughs> even a little more and to talk about some other things too. Sure, I'm so, happy to do that, yeah. So tell us briefly about your prior academic career before your current position. Uh, you've had some other positions in the Minnesota education system. Tell us about those. Sure, sure. Um, I taught several years at uh, uh, public universities, the University of Minnesota as an adjunct faculty and at Augsburg College as adjunct. And then uh, I was a full-time faculty member at Normandale Community College for several years before moving into administration. And what subjects were you teaching as an adjunct? English. Ah, very so good. So I taught writing and literature, poetry, yeah. It was, I, and I still miss it. I have experience myself as an adjunct teaching at Hamlin in sure. the uh, yeah. School of uh, Business, the nonprofit management program. I taught Fantastic. a course for three years. Non, law for nonprofits. So mm. it was a very interesting experience. I really enjoyed it. At DCTC, we just started a certificate in nonprofit management. Oh, you did? Yeah. I wasn't aware of that. And what's unique about that program is we reach out to county leaders who have these roles and they come in each class as guest lecturers. So their students are getting direct experience from pr practitioners who are out there in the field. Very good. Yeah. And we have so many nonprofits here in Minnesota, as many of our viewers know, great nonprofits. We're a national leader mm -hmm. that these are programs that can help train those people for leadership positions in these types of organizations. Right. Yeah. Right. So since 2018, you've been serving, as I mentioned, president of two colleges, Inver Hills Community College and Dakota County Technical, or Dakota Technical. Uh, both of these are part of the Minnesota State College system. Correct. Tell us just briefly, what is the Minnesota State College system? Sure. Well, it's a, it, it came together from, from the technical college system, the community college system, the university system, all brought together into one statewide system, one of the largest in the country. They used to be separate, they right? They did, We right. called them the Votex, I think, Vocational Technical Education. They've gone through a time. number of name changes. Different right? names, yeah. right. Yeah. But what's, what's great about it is it's an opportunity for us to leverage our size to better serve students, to help meet their needs, to, to be able to provide an affordable education. Uh, and so there's a lot of advantages of being a statewide system. 
Mm -hmm. So how does that work for you being president simultaneously of these two different institutions? You literally split your time in two between the two places? I do, yeah. The good thing is they're only about 10 miles apart. Yeah. And so um, I will bounce back and forth. Uh, like we've got maybe 30% of our employees who are shared between the two institutions. Mm -hmm. And so many of us are bouncing back and forth. Um, but the, the advantage is we have opportunities to work together and to collaborate, to share resources, to share expertise. Our academic programs really complement each other well. And so what we're really leaning into this year is how do we advise students so that if, if we don't have a program that they're interested in at Inver, then what can we offer them at DCTC and help mm. facilitate that movement back and forth? Or if we have a class that we're not able to fill, can we share enrollments across the two institutions so that we can, we can help provide more of a guarantee to students that the classes they sign up for will run? Right. Yeah. I remember eons ago when I was a freshman in college, I attended McAllister in mm -hmm. St. Paul. We were part of a consortium, five different colleges, which I think it still exists. Yep. But one of the advantages of that was that if McAllister didn't have a particular course, you may find a, one of the other four right. schools that were in the consortium. And also you could share library resources between the f five different schools. Yep. So definitely some benefits to uh, having that kind of synergy between the yep. two different schools. Well, and we use state resources wisely then, right? Because we're finding ways to be able to share if we're if we're contracting for a service, we can we can contract and ben to benefit to both colleges. Right. Yeah. So we've heard in recent years that uh, state, direct state support from the state of Minnesota, appropriations that go to higher mm -hmm. education um, has changed. The nature of the funding has changed and the amount of funding, mm -hmm. direct appropriations has changed. How much direct state money does Dakota County receive and also Inver Hills? So about 50% of our incoming revenue comes from the state from, from uh, through our, we have an alloc a formula through which the allocation is distributed among the colleges and universities. Um, and you know, this last legislative session, we had one of the most historic investments in higher education, which we've deeply appreciated. Uh, of course, the, the way in which those funds are distributed does impact our budgets. Um, w one of the things that they did was to, they froze tuition, uh, and, so they, and they paid for that difference. Now, they paid for that with one-time money, so our challenge is then once that we get through that biennium, our, 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 all of our operating costs will continue to rise and we'll, we'll, be, we'll be back at a tuition and rate. And you won't was, have that money because the right. state was running a record surplus, budget right. surplus. Right. That so it, so it, it, it is the reality for many of us in public uh, institutions, but it, it, we certainly were deeply appreciative of the investment that they made. Mm -hmm. And the investments they've made in workforce development. So in our partnerships with the county, with nonprofits, with chambers of commerce, with area businesses, there's a lot of money out there that, that are investments in ways mm -hmm. in which we can collaborate together to better mobilize people into the workforce uh, and then to meet the needs of, of our businesses. Uh, Interesting, yeah. because those businesses do directly benefit from the students that you're educating. Absolutely. That you're giving the skills so that they can be good, productive employees there. Yeah. Also, I wanted to ask you, do you get direct federal aid for either of these two schools? Well, certainly through student financial aid. Yep. Yeah. So, so, um, but not direct appropriations to the college, but through the form of financial aid correct. to students. Okay. Now, there has been an earmarks program where the uh, colleges and, and other entities can make direct requests of, of Congress. Mm -hmm. And so we did get um, just over $1 million to help um, resurface. We have a track, a 2.7 mile track behind DCTC, where, and we provide um, much of the training in um, safe driving to area law enforcement, uh, paramedic services, oh. um, mm. um, commercial truck drivers. Uh, city uh, pl snow plows. I mean, there's just a lot of that mm -hmm. training we provide. We're one of the only facilities in the metro area, and that was in desperate need of resurfacing. And so we were able to get direct funding from the federal government through this program to help with that project. And that's something we're working on this year. Yes. So, Michael, if you would describe to us the composition of the student body at Inver Hills and at Dakota County Tech, Dakota sure. Tech. So, one of the ways we talk about enrollments is we call it full year equivalent. So, if a student, you know, we, we have about 60% of the students at, at um, Inver are part time. Mm -hmm. And so, in order for us to kind of get a sense year to year um, how many students we have, we, we say if they were taking 30 credits, so that's our full year equivalent. So, at DCTC, we have 1,900 full year equivalent, and we have about 2,100 full year equivalent at Inver Hills. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and so, between you know, between the two institutions, we serve you know about over ten thousand students. That's really yeah. something, and I assume that the student body of both schools is fairly diverse in terms of economic background, work background, work experience. Yeah. Many of the students are working while they're going to school, so they're working part-time, maybe going to school part-time, right? Right. What would the percentage be, do you know, roughly, how many are working part-time and going to school part-time? Uh, well, um, each, each, each institution has sort of its own profile. Mm -hmm. So at DCTC, um, about 40% of our students, a little under 40% are part-time, mm. whereas at Inverts, it's just over 60% part-time. And that creates challenges for students who are wanting to keep regular progress in getting their, their degrees. Uh, it takes them longer, and so we're, we always try to encourage them to intensify their credit taking so they can get through their education and get to access to jobs that pay better. Right, and, what and the degrees that you offer, they're two-year degrees or four-year degrees? We offer short-term certificates, one-year diplomas, two-year certificates, mm -hmm. right. Yep, and um, going back to your, your composition question, you know we have very diverse racially and ethnic uh, with eth ethnicity. Mm -hmm. So about forty-two percent of our students at Inver, about thirty-three uh, percent of our students at DCTC are students of color. Um, gender diversity is a little different. Uh, about sixty percent of our students at Inver are female, and then about uh, thirty or about uh, actually I, I wrote it down because I always, don't always remember. Uh, about sixty percent of our 43% of our students at DCTC are female. Interesting, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and give us an idea to somebody who's watching who may be thinking, hmm, I should maybe look at enrolling at Inver Hills Community College or at Dakota Technical. What are we looking at in terms of tuition for carrying a typical credit load? How much does it cost to go to sure. school for a year right now? Um, so we, one of the ways you can measure it is just by how much it costs per credit. Mm -hmm. So. If, so, so if a student is at, at DCTC, it's about $219. Mm -hmm. At Invert's uh, $201. And um, if you're taking a full-time load for two years, you know, you're looking at about 6,500 at DCTC, about 5,000 at Inver. Mm -hmm. And that's about a sixth the cost for the tuition at the University of Minnesota. It's about a seventh of the cost at St. Thomas. And there's variabilities with tuition tuition discounting and scholarships right. and things like that, but but yeah. That's interesting you bring that up because I actually have relatives who have taken note of what you just observed about the significantly lower costs of tuition in the state college system and your schools compared to the University of Minnesota sure. Twin Cities campus, even accounting for in-state tuition, right. Right? right? And so this may be a significant factor that makes college more affordable for certain students that otherwise wouldn't be able to go at all. Sure, sure, and we, have, we tend to have you know, um, many of our, our universities tend to have larger class sizes in the first two years. We tend to have very low class sizes the first two years, so we can offer a, a, a great alternative, get your first two years secured and then trans transfer. And, and w what it does is it gives you time to think about what's the right university for me depending mm -hmm. on my program of study. Mm -hmm. You know, 60% of the students who come to Inver uh, declare the general AA degree, and oftentimes that means they don't really know what they want to do. Right. They're there to get their general education. That's a great opportunity for career exploration. Right. And but that still yeah. having that general degree gives you the background foundation to go out and do great things and find a great career. Absolutely. Better yeah. than not having it, obviously. Right, yeah. right. And there are all kinds of studies that show the benefits of education. I think it's still true. We talk mm -hmm. about an income gap in this country. One of the most pronounced points of the income gap has to do with education. That's right. That people who have a degree, an associate degree or two-year degree, uh, or even a certificate, I would imagine, yep. tend to do better economically, get paid more than people who may graduate with a high school diploma or without a diploma. Yep, no, that's true. And, it, and it, right now the economy is so strong that we're mm -hmm. seeing a lot of high school students upon graduation going right into the workforce. Mm -hmm. And if, if that's what they, they need to do for themselves and their families, that's, that's great. I think what we hope that they understand then what are the long-term implications, because the longer you wait to get that, that college education, then the, the more challenging it might be for them just personally to go back to school. Right. Um, so, and we're, there's also other kinds of programs too. There's, there's um, 
uh, apprenticeship programs, there's direct training that, that many employers are providing. And what we're trying to do is work with some of those entities to say, can we do a both and? Mm -hmm. Can you do an apprenticeship and earn college credit that could be the foundation for further education down the road? For those apprenticeships, do you work, for example, with businesses and labor unions to get students mm -hmm. matched up with apprenticeship programs? Yeah, yep. Um, I, not as extensively as, as I would like, and mm -hmm. part of that I think is just getting our agencies to work more more uh, in concert with each other. Mm -hmm. um, but we've got a great program that we're bringing. Uh, so we're, we're partnering with with Johnson Controls. They're providing funding for us to do recruitment um, in St. Paul. So to really trying to diversify the HVAC industry. Mm. And so then we're 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 using the the pipe fitters union site to provide the training because it's close to the high schools that we want to uh, reach out to. And so the the unions, their opportunity is to then potentially recruit these students into their apprenticeship programs upon graduation. Right. So it's a great partnership, yeah. And the record heat we've been experiencing here in the Twin Cities this past week, Might we want to make sure career. we have plenty of HVAC <laughs> technicians on the job ready to go when we call. So. Let's shift focus from the students for a moment. I'd like you to describe, if you would, Michael, what are the faculties like at these two different schools that you serve as president of? What are their backgrounds? Sure. Where do they come from? How do you recruit them? Sure. And how many of them do you have? Um, well, the the numbers vary depending on each institution, but we've mm -hmm. you know they're they're our largest employee group, and you know. By the by, the the policies we've set up to help ensure that we have faculty who have, are highly qualified, is they have to have at minimum a master's, but many that can come with their their doctorates in field. Mm. Um, now, on the technical side, there may not be educational programs beyond the the two year program, mm -hmm. and so many of our faculty will engage in ongoing professional development their entire careers, and they'll bring in they'll they'll do certification upon certification, get recertified uh, so that. The, the quality that they bring in terms of their, their disciplinary knowledge is, is outstanding. I mean, it, and some of them are coming, you know, they'll, they'll um, work in the summers within their industry, bring back some of the latest knowledge, some of the latest techniques. They'll also work continually with area employers, um, whether through advisory committees or they'll, they'll continually go out and, and work with students who are apprenticeship, you know, we're going through like a, um, on-site training, mm -hmm. the, or, or either a clinical or, or um, an internship. Right. Yeah. So there's right. this, there's that deep engagement with with industry that I think is a hallmark of our community and technical colleges. That and we should say, you know, when people think about internships, these are really important moments in a student's development, in their career development, because they expose you. You get a depth of knowledge about the field that you may be working in. Right. I know when I was going through college and did a couple of different internships and clerkships, I ended up going into law. but. It gave you a, a real great sense, yeah. a fuller understanding of what just what you were going to be doing and what you were going to get into for a career. Right, right. Yeah. The last thing you want is a student to to um, go through their whole educational program only to discover that once they get into the workplace, they don't like the job. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which is unfortunate considering the cost of education that right. you really should have some good sense of what it actually costs to get through this. Right. And many of our technical programs, the students will go to school in the mornings and they'll work at one of the employers in the afternoon. And, yeah. and the good thing about that, that work and learn model, is that as they get greater skill, they get greater responsibility at work. And so by the time they're done, they're on the floor you know, as a diesel mechanic or as a, a line worker or as a, a nurse. Um, and so they've, they've you know, eased right into a place of employment. Right. And so our cool. students, uh, just curious if it works this way too, that students can actually get academic credit for on-the-job experience. Right. Yep. They can. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's different mechanisms for that. I mean, some inter all internships you generally have credit attached to them, and there are learning outcomes that they have to mm -hmm. achieve, and and their faculty are working with them through the process. But if they're already employed, so about you know about a thirty percent at each institution are students who are we would consider adult learners, mm -hmm. and they may be coming in with lived experience. They may be coming in with military training or or um, positions in the military, and we can give them credit for that. That accelerates their their time to degree. Mm -hmm. yeah. So do both of these colleges, uh, Inver Hills and Dakota Technical, do you have placement offices or people who work in placement to actually match students up with particular job openings? So at, at 
uh, Inver, we do, we have a Center for Career Development, and then at DCTC that function is covered by some of our advisors. Um, but the two colleges work together, and we also, so a lot of our faculty have a role in that placement by, by connecting employers who are looking for job opportunities. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and this is just an example from the non-credit, uh, our professional truck driver program. So um, we work with employers who will, will loan us trucks, and the opportunity is then to come in and be able to, to make a pitch mm. to students who are in the program of, hey, wouldn't you like to come work for us? And uh, it's a great opportunity. And, and so then, you know, at, when they graduate, many of those students have careers already started. That's really great. Yeah. 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 So that sort of answers what my next question was, is what is the success of your placement? It's pretty high, it isn't is it? It is in the 90%, yeah. That's tremendous. And that includes students who also go on for further education, because many of our students, particularly at Inver Hills, they're there to start their education, but they're intending to go on to a four-year. Um, and so we include that in our success rates that they've, they've uh, transfer, transferred to a four-year institution is continuing. Question that just occurred to me, would you say, is it fair to say that your placement rate may actually be higher than most private liberal arts colleges or public liberal arts programs? Is that fair to say, or we don't really know? I don't, yeah, I'd have to look at their okay. placement rates. Um, yeah. And there's there's a lot of variation, too, in, in their missions. Right. right. And so those that, that tend to work closer with industry um, may have you know equally strong placement rates. Right, and I know a high portion, high proportion of people in liberal arts, for example, are preparing to go on to graduate school too. So that yeah. may be the case. It's surprising how many of those students who get a, even their AA degree will will go will, will already be working and then and then use that as an opportunity to advance. Uh, and, and so you know that liberal arts degree is is still highly valuable, even if it's not tied to a particular trade. Right. Um, right. You look at what employers are looking for, and they're looking for people who can problem solve, who can communicate effectively, work well with others, have some intercultural fluency, and a mm -hmm. lot of those are the outcomes of our general education. Mm -hmm. We've just gone through this um, terrible pandemic from mm -hmm. 2020 to uh, just kind of winding down in the past year or so, or less than the past year. And it created tremendous dislocations in our economy. But some of those dislocations have actually been going on before the pandemic. Right. And I'm talking specifically about the retirement of the baby boom generation, sure. the largest demographic blip in American history. Some 80 million Americans, those of us who were born between 1946, 1966. I'm right in the middle of that, 1956, <laughs> and I retired three years ago. So there are a lot of jobs that are open now, yeah. but the pandemic seems to have accelerated the trend of people retiring early. Mm -hmm. I know it did for me. And so uh, doesn't this create some really important openings for students considering higher education now and getting additional training and developing additional skills? Absolutely. Um, what the I just saw a recent statistic that was something like the for every job for every uh, person who's looking, there's like six job openings. Mm. That it, it, it's astonishing the number of, uh, the, the, the demand out there for employment. Mm -hmm. And so one of the opportunities I think is how can we work with existing employers who now their challenge is how do I hold on yeah. to, to talent? Right, and they have to be competitive in terms right. of what they're paying them, wages and benefits and perhaps healthcare, pensions, other things such as that. And, and so yeah. one of the things we're working on is how do we provide educational benefits and work with employers to, to create pathways within their own companies. I, I stopped at McDonald's this morning and it said right there on the, the, the now sign. Now hiring. <laughs> well, not now hiring, but also $2,500 oh, educational benefit. Oh, really? And wow. so we'll help pay for your tuition if you come work with us. And that's mm -hmm. more and more we're seeing as a trend with employers. Mm -hmm. And so we want to work with them where we can to create more pathways for future advancement. Yeah. Very interesting. Uh, Michael, you and I had talked previously and you mentioned to me, uh, which I hadn't really thought about, the role of Inver Hills Community College in civic engagement. Yeah. You promote civic engagement with your students. You have a big event coming up next month in September called C Congress to Campus. Did right. I get that right? You did. Congress yeah. to Campus. What is this event? When and where is it? Sure. Um, so I think it's 25th of September, 26th. Mm -hmm. um, so what, what 
it's a it's a program that that um, brings former legislators from the Republican Democratic Party together. And they come onto a campus and they talk with students, they talk with the public, they engage with their faculty and staff. And the idea is to help promote that, that you know, when, when, legisl when legislators work well, that, that bipartisanship. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, it, it's a great opportunity for, for um, students to, to see what's, what the legislative process can look like when it's working well, mm -hmm. or at least when it's working better. <laughs> Um, and it's a great opportunity. I know that uh, Secretary Simon, I think, is is coming to be part of a panel to talk more about ways you know, how social media is impacting mm. uh, civic engagement. Mm -hmm. uh, and Inver's for had a, good and ill. <laughs> well, right, right. It's a it's an opportunity to mobilize vo voters, but it's also an right. opportunity to to disseminate misinformation and right. Because yeah. it seems in our time that we're in right now, so many people are turned off to politics because of the ferocity of the rhetoric on all sides and the inability to find common ground and right. compromise, which mm -hmm. uh, so I, so I don't know who said it, but when I worked previously, uh, had worked on Capitol Hill in Washington, someone said compromise is the mother's milk of politics. <laughs> that basically what they were trying to express was the idea you don't get anything done unless you're willing to work with people who don't right. necessarily look at issues or the world the same way you do, but you have to try to come together and get something done. Right. Yeah. Right. One of the one of the great benefits in my position is I get to work with legislators on both sides of the aisle, mm -hmm. and and I do find for the most part they do work well together. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes we let the rhetoric um, obscure our view that they are actually are getting things done and they are right. actually working together. And and I find that that um, you know I'm, we're in a, a swing district in Dakota County, and so there's strong presence from Republicans and Democrats. Right. And so as a public institution, we're committed to working. With yeah, everyone. With everyone, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, yeah, very good. And uh, the community, there's a community forum that is a part of this event, I understand, Congress to Campus. Say a word about that. Yeah, and, and I don't know all the details of that, but, okay. but what we will do is share on our website at Inverhills. Uh, dot edu that you know when the opportunity presents itself and what time it will be and what format it will take we we're still waiting to hear who the legislators are that the former mm -hmm. legislators who are coming mm -hmm. but yeah that that's something we try to uh, to create regular opportunities is for people to come onto campus and see how beautiful it is mm -hmm. uh, it's one of the greatest selling points is when you can actually get on the campus and see what it's like right uh, but it's also a great opportunity to to serve in that role Part of our historic mission is to is to help foster civic engagement that's right. in the legislation, and so we want to try to honor that in our work. Michael, we're down to less than two minutes now, and I just want to ask you uh, if you could tell me what do you see as the biggest challenge or opportunity ahead of the state college system in Minnesota, and particularly for Inver Hills and Dakota Technical? I think one of our greatest value propositions is that we can help connect students to employment. And, and yet we have all of these agencies working on that. And if we can work better together, I think we can, we can help mobilize more people to meet the, the workforce needs. Uh, and I think we can help make sure that they have the skills that are needed by employers and then help to, to mobilize employers to be part of the solution and to work with us. Mm -hmm. so I think that's the, the biggest challenge we have and I see great opportunity there. And it seems like a real key to what you're talking about here is this coalition of employers the colleges working together and, and bringing the students in, and the nonprofits, Absolutely. which I hadn't really thought about that, the role of nonprofits yeah. in supporting the college's mission too. Yeah, many of these nonprofits are trying to help their clients get to self-sustaining wages, mm -hmm. and one of the ways through that is education and training. And so mm -hmm. they want to work with us to help uh, provide their clients with, with education so they can become self-sufficient. That's really yeah. great. Michael Burnt, president of two colleges, Inver Hills Community College and the Dakota Technical College in Rosemount. Thank you for coming back on our program today to discuss the recent developments at both of these schools and the outstanding contributions they make to our community. Thank you for your leadership on this too and being our guest today on Access to Democracy. It's been a pleasure, thank you. Ha, <laughs> ha,